I'm happy to give you a presentation about our results and our activity in the area of rehabilitation robots, rehabilitation robots which are used for gait training and arm training. Just about my background, I'm affiliated at the ETH Zurich, which is the Technical University of Zurich, and I'm also affiliated at the University Hospital of Balgrist, where we can develop and evaluate our robotic systems on patients, on stroke patients and also on spinal cord injured patients, together with our physicians and therapists. So, this kind of therapy is quite common in rehabilitation after stroke or spinal cord injury where two or even three therapists need to guide the leg of a patient walking on a treadmill. But this is, uh, this is necessary to cause some efferent feedback to get nervous feedback through the spine to the brain maybe to have some recovery in the brain after stroke or have recovered in the spine after spinal cord injury. However, this is very personally intensive. It's exhausting for the therapist, it's expensive, and therefore this training is limited in time and in effect. It's much better to do a longer training and a more intensive training than it is currently possible with this kind of human support. There are several challenges in rehabilitation. So, First of all, we know that intensive therapy is very good. A lot of training and long training is important for getting an improvement, getting a health improvement and a better quality of life. However, there's an increasing number of patients because of the demographic shift. So more and more people are getting older. There's a higher risk for stroke and other problems. So there's a more and more need to get therapy and rehabilitation for more and more people. And last but not least, there's a shortage of personnel. So we need a lot of persons to do this rehabilitation, but they're not available, the therapists. That's the idea how we can apply robotics in the area of rehabilitation to solve these three and other challenges. And one solution is to apply such kind of robotic technology. That's the Locomart, which was developed in Zurich by Gary Colomba and Volker Dietz in the 90s. It's a robot with uh, two actuations at the hip and at the knee joint, both legs. So it has four actuated degrees of freedom. Patients are walking on a treadmill and their body weight support system, body weight support supported. It's a gate-like pattern and by doing this, by applying this machine, the therapy can be done longer Patients can start in an earlier stage in the rehabilitation and the rehabilitation outcome is usually better than in conventional therapy. What are, there are several of these platforms. The Locomart is just one, but there are many platforms like Lopez Lo or the outer emulator which are exoskeletal devices. There are other L effector based devices like the gate trainer or the GO. Also in upper extremity rehabilitation, there are many devices like the MRT Manus or the B-Manu Track, the Gentle system which was used some years ago, or other also exoskeletal systems are being developed and also partly being used already in therapy. We in our lab developed the Armin system, a special device for training of the upper extremity for stroke patients and also tetraplegic patients. We started more than 10 years ago, we developed already four generations of this device and that's the first device which you see here which just had four axes, four actuated axes which we developed and tested on many, on many patients. We further improved the technology by adding some more axes, by improving the, especially the shoulder actuation, the shoulder joint of the human subjects is quite complex, it's uh, often not instable in the stroke patients and therefore we spend a lot of effort to actuate the shoulder joint of the humans by special robotic technology. We also test this device on many patients and then we developed a version which is um, which was used in a randomized clinical study an improved robotic device with seven degrees of freedom. Seven joints are actuated. We developed five of these versions and four of them were used in a clinical study in Switzerland. 
it's mechanically more robust. It's a more, it's a bit more uh, simple, simpler to to use and to to do the donning and doffing. And uh, we also developed some games and activity of living uh, tasks to have a task-oriented training. That's what you see here. That's a patient, a chronic uh, stroke patient, who can use this device as an exoskeletal device. They're using also this uh, graphical interface to be able to train activities of daily living tasks in a virtual environment. And also the hand has been actuated here. It's important to also use the hand, so the more distal parts of the human body, to be really able to use the training or to apply training for tasks which are relevant in daily life, where you need to use the hand and the arm. Then we did this multicentral trial, multicentrical trial in four clinics with the hypothesis that we said that this kind of training, this kind of also special assist as needed or patient responsive training with such a, a device which allows activities of their living is more effective than conventional training with respect to the motor function of the arm. So that the special goal was that we improve the motor function of the arm in hemiparetic stroke patients which were chronic. Chronic means that it's a while ago, at least six months after they had the stroke. This was a study design, so it's a controlled and clinical trial, randomized, so we had two groups, one was a conventional group, one was a robotic group, and the people did not know to which group they would go. It was randomized so in four centers. We did uh, include in the testing 275 patients and only 77 of them were included in this study. We had four dropouts. Finally, we have the results of 73 patients. We included patients with a special score. That's a Fugemeyer score. It gives information about the motor function of the arm. And the maximum score you can get as a healthy subject is 66 points. And those patients got between 8 and 38. So these are severely to moderately affected patients in the chronic stage, meaning six months after the stroke. This primary outcome is the main outcome we need to have in clinical studies. You have to have one main outcome, um, that's the Fugelmeier score. And there are also secondary outcomes which were included for the discussion of the results. Uh, for example, the valve motor function test, that's a test to especially um, investigate some functional aspects of the arm to assess these aspects. And there are also some questionnaires about um, uh, giving information about the daily life uh, the quality of life, also psychological aspects of life and comfort. And then there's also an Ashworth test giving information about specificity. And we also did some quantitative recordings. We measured the range of motion called ROM and the joint talks with, by using the Armin robotic device. That's the time course. We have um, the beginning where we do the baseline test. We just tested uh, if the patients can be included into the in, uh, study. Then we started at week zero. We had eight weeks of training. In these eight weeks, we had 24 sessions. Each session took one hour, or including the donning and doffing, so 45 minutes of training. And we had um, the, all these tests where we used, where we applied these uh, special scores, these questionnaires, the tests on the army device, at the beginning, in the middle of the therapy, and then at the end of the therapy. And then we had six more months after the therapy where we investigated um, or t assessed the patients again at the, after two months and after six months after the end of the therapy. Within the session was like this that the patients were treated for 45 minutes. That's the same in the robot group and the conventional group. We, also the choice of training being done is the same. So we, there's a mobilization where we do some, some just some stretching and moving the joints. Then there were games supported by the computer in the robotic room or conventional games in the conventional group. And then activities of the living tasks like cooking and uh, cosmetic aspects um, or filling a glass of wine or water. And the difference was that in the conventional group the therapists were free to decide how long they do the training. It was based on the, train, on the experience they have and uh, on, on, on their belief how the training has to be to be maximally successful. That's uh, one of the results. In the primary outcome, the Fugemeyer score, you see that the robotic group, that's the one, the upper group, the upper curve here, shows a 
higher effect, it's significantly better than a conventional group. That's a delta uh, value, so it starts with uh, delta of zero, of course, and we have then after eight weeks um, 3.4 points of improvement in the Fugemeyer score compared in the robbery group compared to only 2.6 points in the conventional group. That's, however, quite little. It's uh, doubtful if this, if this has a clinical meaning, but still the difference is significant. So it was a clear difference, although it was small. What's interesting now is that in the robotic group we get this value of 2.6 already in the middle of the therapy. So it's just, you could interpret this that the training is double the speed. It's, it's much faster to get this improvement. And we still have a slope here at the end of the therapy, so we question Maybe if you would have done the therapy longer, maybe the improvement would be much much higher. But we do not know. We have to do another study to figure out this. Another result now is the following. If you just take the more severely affected patients with a Fugumaya score, uh, which is much less than about 20 points, then we get an even better result. Then the difference is even larger. Then the control group has a less strong effect and the robotic group has a higher effect. So more severely affected patients, weaker patients, have a better benefit using the robot compared to conventional group. So let's just summarize the results. We have a more effective result, especially with patients who are more severely impaired, but the differences are still little. It's cl clinically questionable if it's uh, important. Uh, the question is maybe the patients are too chronic, they were saturated already, and then it's more difficult to get an, improve an improvement. And another question is, where are the responders? So there are patients where we saw a strong increase, a strong improvement. There are other patients where there were only little or no improvement. And the question is, who are the responders? So who are the patients who have the best improvement? And what are their properties? What, is their, um, what are their characteristics? And how can we optimize the training to always get an optimum in the patient? So, coming back to the history of the development of the robot device, we, we um, have uh, proceeded with the developments. There was uh, the luck that we could commercialize the robot to the company Fukuma. They are now distributing and selling this device with the name Ameo Power. There's also a fourth generation of this device being used with a better force recording, a better, there's, some, there's some more sensors inside to have a better, um, to allow better robotic and quantitative assessment of the patient status. And we made a special MR compatible version, so a version which works in the uh, magneto um, uh, resonance uh, imaging device so that we can use it for basic science. We can now investigate what is really changing in the brain when a patients are being treated with such kind of device. It's working in this MR environment we also made a children version with an improved kinematic structure, improved control, different games, and we are able to change the robot size to different body sizes. In children we have a large variation in the body size between small children and older children who can be 18 years old or 17 years old. And that's uh, how, you, uh, how it looks like. A special kinematic stru structure and we can change the distal part depending on the size of the child. Very important is the special interaction between the human and the robot and uh, we did a lot of development here. It must be very intensive this training to have a stronger effect, so it must be fast, it must be long, there must be many repetitions per time unit. It must not be guided but it must be very sensitively, cooperatively be controlled. There must be done something like as an assist as needed control to always let the patient participate in the training. That's what we know from many basic studies and we are developing the robot in this way. The robot must behave transparent, mechanically transparent, whenever it's not needed in short durations, in the subsequence of any kind of movement phases. And we developed uh, controllers which are able to be transparent and also cooperative. For example, this path controller or tunnel controller provides a tunnel, a virtual tunnel, where the leg of the patient, for example, can move freely inside the tunnel. And only when the leg is touching the tunnel walls because the movement is not so good, it's deviating too much from a desired movement, the patients are 
then correct it and support it whenever necessary. These are some results. We get a higher heart rate, that's good. The patients are more active. They should, to be, they should be active, they should participate to the movement. Also, muscle activity is higher in this special kind of path controller. That's also what we want. They should contribute to the movement. And we also get a larger variability. That's also good. We know from learning of movements also in sports that a larger variability is very good to have a better learning effect. Another thing is the motivation, aspect of motivation. It's very important that people are motivated because they have to go to the therapy, it's exhausting, it can be boring, and we need to find ways to always keep them active and also keep them motivated. And one idea is here to apply virtual reality technology, special games implemented in very immersive environments where the people can, for example, walk through a virtual path, virtual forest, where they can do different obstacles or tasks. That's very intuitive, that's very easy to explain it, it's self-explaining and it's really motivating. And this kind of motivation is very important because we know that there's a neuroplastic effect when we apply movement, physical activity. And we know when we are mentally active because we have to act in this kind of virtual environment, that this kind of neuroplastic effects are much stronger. We can do this by engagement. This engagement refers to physical acti activity but also mental activity. What else is important are the ways um, how the robot interacts with the human subjects, how you implement them in the game. It's very important to give reward, to show the patients how they perform and to show them that they perform good. You can do this in a different way, implicitly by getting scores in the game, but also explicitly giving them money or food. And one special reward is a social reward. Um, here you see some games, for example, where they see the reward because they're successfully performing a kitchen task, a cooking task, for example, with many kind of different tasks uh, to give them different kind of rewards. And that's a special remote control array where people can play table tennis. Let's give them a social reward. They know that they're playing against another human in another hospital. And we could show that an even better result can be observed when they're sitting next to each other in the same room. They can talk to each other. It's like a meeting with friends. And they can play together. They can play together against the computer or they can play in a competitive way against each other. And it's in either way depends on the personality very engaging and motivating. What will the future be? In the future we have this problem of this large variability. We have to find responders who are really re reacting, who are showing uh, an effect in the therapy. You see here the results of the robotic group and that of the control group and we have a large variability. There are some responders with a large improvement but there are also some non-responders in both groups. And the question is, what kind of technical features do we have to optimize to find the right responders and to get the maximum improvement in a single individual patient? The features we have are different. For example, the dose intensity. It can be different. It depends on the subject. If they need a lot of training or less training, then we can train the distal parts of the hand or, or the limb or the more proximal parts. We can have different ranges of movement. We can apply different kind of goals, uh, games and controllers. We can apply different kind of difficulty levels. We have to adjust it to the individual patient, to the personality of the patient. There can be different kind of graphical feedback, sound feedback, maybe even olfactory feedback, tactile feedback, vibrational feedback. And all these features have to be adjusted to the individual subject to always get the maximum outcome in the patients. Because every patient is reacting in a different way and we have to find what kind of features do we have to adjust to the individual patient in order to improve or to, to, to maximize the therapeutic outcome. Many approaches so far do ignore the patient activity. So it's very important that you increase the therapeutic outcome by incorporating the patient and check when the patient is active or, or provoke that the patients can be active and participating to the training and to the movement. So this means that the Robots must be patient cooperative in order to enhance patient activity, but also engage them and increase patient motivation. So novel technical features have to be implemented to allow this kind of increased patient motivation and engagement, but also they have to be optimized, they have to be tailored to the individual subject to get the best outcome for each individual subject. We have to find the responders and for this we still need a lot of many more clinical studies.
Happy birthday to the International Journal of Advanced Robotic Systems, to the 10 years of existence.